Okay, I want to welcome everyone to Franchising 101, Small Business Ownership. We have Dana Hall with us today with FranNet. Um, Dana has uh, will introduce himself and explain um, his level, you know, why he's the expert on this topic here shortly. Um, he, he's given this presentation for us before and does a fantastic job, so we're glad to have him back. But I want to talk really quickly about SCORE and what we do. Um, there's three main components to SCORE, and one of it, one of those components is the webinars uh, with our training, and we do some in-person workshops uh, as well. Uh, I encourage you to watch for our newsletter. Usually it comes out on Mondays. And to um, also check out the website, uh, and I'll put that information into chat to see what we have coming up. Uh, the other thing we have and I, on the websites, and I definitely encourage you to look this stuff up because it, there's just tons of information, are um, business templates and, resource and resources, blogs, all kinds of information, the templates you can actually download and fill in. Um, it's There's a lot of really great tools there. Uh, the most important thing that we do, however, is the mentoring. Our mentoring is free and confidential and our mentors are volunteers and they come to us with a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and experiences to share with small business owners. Our business, the people they work with are those that are just thinking about trying to start a business and want to find out if it's right for them to those that are are planning that business and those that are already in business. Uh, we have mentors that can speak to many different business topics uh, that you can even imagine, uh, work-life balance, keeping books, um, marketing, branding, you name the business topic, we have a mentor that can assist you. And if we don't in our local chapter, we can look in the district or national um, database to find someone for you. Uh, a mentoring session, the first time will probably be around 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, they want to know what your goals and what your uh, challenges are, and they will work with you to put together a plan, um, sometimes bringing in other mentors to assist as we as the as you go along to get a mentor you can scan that qr code or you can go to the score.org website and put in your zip code and it will match you to the chapter that's nearest you and you will be able to put in what you need in a mentor and how they can help you uh and as i mentioned here's the the, the websites to our our district um and you can uh, go to any of those to find a mentor or, or workshops or all those um library tools that I mentioned as well. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull my share down. I'm going to turn it over to Dana with FranNet and give him the opportunity to introduce himself and um, tell us about franchises. Thank you so much, Teresa. I appreciate it. I want to make sure this is on slideshow. So thank you, Teresa, once again. Uh, good morning, folks. Appreciate you taking a few minutes uh, to talk about small business ownership. Uh, the focus of this uh, will be on franchising, uh, but we will talk about you know a few other areas or other ways to be uh, in business or to get into business. So um, let's get underway. Who am I? My name is Dana Hall. I am a franchise consultant with a firm called FranNet. Um, I will talk about them in a second real briefly. I have uh, over 25 years experience uh, in the franchise space um, on all sides of it. Uh, I worked for a couple of very large uh, franchisors. That's the parent company in Wendy's and Panera Bread. I had operations roles there. I had uh, uh, senior finance uh, roles there and also marketing roles there. So I've seen a lot and I worked for a couple of very uh, good franchise companies. So I have a uh, pretty wide experience in the franchise space. So real quickly, who are we? Uh, Franet is an international franchise consulting firm. Um, we have folks in the, obviously in the US, about 80 uh, more folks in, um, in Canada. Uh, we're extremely proud of our partnerships with SCORE and the Small Business Development Centers. Uh, Service Corps Retired Executive SCORE is a hidden gem. Uh, as Teresa had explained, their services, what they do, you're talking professional consulting uh, for free. Uh, it's pretty hard to beat. Um, and I have sent a number of my clients uh, to score to help in, in those specific areas that she talked about. And what's great is you have a mentor, you present your 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 uh, strategy or your, uh, 
your issues, your concerns, your struggles. Um, they're going to help you find the right person if it's not them or even a team of people. So um, we work with uh, over 200 top quality franchise companies, uh, and we actually have great relationships with franchise funding companies as well. So, so that's who we are, but what do we do? What does FranNet do? Uh, we're educators, we're guides, um, we're, we're counselors, um, and we're here to educate folks on franchising. If they truly are interested and it's right for them, we will uh, then uh, introduce them to franchise companies. Our role is to find a fit. We are matchmakers. We are here first to determine whether franchise or any business ownership is appropriate. It's not for everybody. Uh, and it all depends on their skills, their background, their goals, timing in life. Uh, so, but if it is uh, an appropriate time and it makes sense, then then we'll do a, a whole go through a whole process to to match folks to a, the franchise. The business is going to meet those goals, uh, and we do this at no cost to a client. Uh, we get paid by the franchise companies a commission, uh, much like an executive recruiter would. Uh, uh, on the back end, should you be an investor and become a franchisee. So that's who we are. That's what we do. And that's why I'm here is to, to, uh, to give you some information on the franchise space. This is 50,000 foot. We'll talk a little bit from our experience about uh, why people uh, do this. Um, we'll talk about options. We're going to debunk some myths. Um, and then we'll talk about, okay, if this, if it's, this is something you're really considering, you know, what are the first initial steps? What are the truly the things to start thinking about? Um, so here we go. So I'm just going to look at this chat real quick. Okay, good. Um, and feel free to type questions in that chat as we go. I'll make sure I address them uh, either within the presentation or at the end. Where it's so this is based on our experience. Um, I've been with Franet for five years. I have peers that have been with Franet for 25. I draw on their experience. And so when you say, you know, why do people consider this? Um, you know, so I was a W-2 employee for 20 plus years. You know, why am I doing this now? And, and it's always gonna be some combination of, of these factors. And a couple of these may even, you know, resonate with, with you, but these are the time and again, uh, some of the main reasons that people come to us. The, the, the serial layoff, they're looking to control their own destiny, create their own financial security. We hear a ton, more, more than any of these words, the two are control and flexibility, control over their life, their schedule, uh, and, and, and within that flexibility. So yeah, owning a business is hard work. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It's, you know, it's not easy, but a lot of it can be done on your timeline. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. So, you know, now you're in control, um, fulfillment, independence, and, and certainly opportunity to build a, a business uh, and, and to make good money, hopefully. That's my screen here, sorry. Okay, so that's the, so that's some of the reasons that we've seen over and over again. What, what are your options for doing so? I, I want to be my own, my own boss. You can start a business from scratch. You could buy an existing business, a resale. There's a very robust market for that. Uh, or you can buy into a franchise. And even that could be a resale. And I'll explain that in a second. So what are the pros and cons of some of these things? And this is just um, trying to give you some things to consider. Um, hence the name of the whole thing, options and considerations. So if you're going to start your own business, what are the things you need to be aware of uh, in terms of the advantages, disadvantages? You have all the control. You get to make all the decisions. You're the boss, truly, entire, in its entirety. Room for creativity. No rules. The largest upside, for sure. And, and it truly could be something, hey, I've had this idea. I've always wanted to do it this way, my way. You can build something from, from a passion uh, point of view. What are some of the disadvantages? Well, it can be all that can be daunting. You know, you have the great folks from SCORE, for instance, that can assist. But, you know, ultimately it is on you. There's not a blueprint. There's not a, a game plan. 
when you start your own business. You've got to create it. It's up to you. So you got to create all the systems. Um, you know, there tends to be a, a, a slower ramp up. You're iterating. You're, um, you know, making mistakes and correcting and, and sort of figuring it out as you go. And that can take time. And the financial part of it can be a little daunting too on your own. Um, you know, it's going to have to be your own money, family money, you know, uh, uh, loans. And the getting a loan is much more difficult nowadays. The idea of a bank, you know, with a great business plan that you have taking a chance, they don't do that nearly as much uh, as they used to for, for a true small business. So just some things to consider. If you were to buy a business, there's pros and cons there as well. So I, I'll preface all this with you know, a good business. You know, what is a good business? One that's you know viable, profitable, um, in, in you know in good shape, so to speak. And, and that's a subjective term, but um, it, you know a good business ought to have cash flow, right? It should be profitable, uh, goodwill of customers, and potentially employees. Actual financial results. This is a big advantage, right? Tax returns, profit and loss statements you can kind of see the track record of that business. For that reason, it's attractive to lenders because they have something to lend against, a history. There ought to be a market for the established, right? Depending on how long this business has, has been operating. Uh, a customer base, maybe it comes with some existing employees. Um, and hopefully that owner has documented a lot of what has made him or her successful systems. That's such a big thing is to be able to follow a blueprint. And even sometimes there could be owner financing involved. Disadvantages, again, you know, it's it's a little bit of a flip side. It, you know, if it's a distressed business, and sometimes that's not always obvious, uh, maybe it's not profitable. Um, maybe there isn't a good reputation out there in the market. Um, you know, are there uh, issues with, with potentially some of the key employees that are part of that business that make it successful? They leave because that owner um, that's selling is no longer there. So understanding the employee aspect of it. Uh, the couple that it's really tough, and you can get experts, accountants, and so forth to help with this, but how do you price it? How do you know you're not overpaying? How do you know it's the right price? Is there training and support? And the last one, know that when you buy an existing business, there's a, there's a, a trade-off between if you if you build something from the ground up, that's you know the old term sweat equity, right? If you buy a business, that's financial equity. So you're having a you will pay a premium for having bought that business because that person wants to sell at a profit. If it's making a hundred thousand dollars, just for instance, round numbers, there's going to be a multiple of that number that will be the sale price, and so. It will be relatively higher speaking financially, a higher cost to buy an existing established quality business. You're trading time for money in that, in that regard. And finally, a franchise business. You know, a franchise is a small business like any other mom and pop business. It just happens to be legally a little different. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and with it comes some advantages. Sometimes there's, you know, wide uh, name recognition, you know, brand names, big names. Um, they, but any of these franchise businesses should have some intellectual property, trademarks, websites, you know, license agreements, um, that sort of thing. A proven business system, that's why you're buying, <laughs> that's why you're paying a franchise fee and royalties, because this is an established business system as a blueprint. They should provide excellent training and support. Again, why you're why you're investing in that, because they have built something out that you don't have to. So training and support, training being training you on exactly what the business does, but then support around operations, marketing, real estate if that's involved, all those ancillary parts of the business. Uh, I would say, you know, there's not a lot of empirical evidence around there around the failure rate, but anecdotally. Especially in certain industries like restaurants, there there are uh, there is generally speaking a lower failure rate. 
if it's a good quality franchise business and you follow the model. Uh, it's lower cost for that reason, because you're not making those mistakes, wasting time, iterating, um, you know, spending money where you shouldn't, that sort of thing. Great financing options because a lot of the companies in the franchise world are known to lenders. Um, so there's a history there to lend against. Uh, we'll talk about disclosure, a very big advantage. And then the, the franchise family, that being the franchise or so the parent company that's going to provide all this blueprint, support, training, and whatnot, but also other franchisees. You know, you're not going to be the only one. 50, 100, 200 other franchisees in the system that now become your peers and are there to guide, assist, um, and you'll even be able to talk to those folks uh, before you would make an investment. So the franchise family is a big part uh, of the franchise model. It's not all perfect. So disadvantages, there's not an industry for everything. I get people you know, asking, oh, do you have this sort of business? You know, there's not a franchise for every business out there. Um, they do tend to have, and this could be a pro or a con, I guess it's your viewpoint, very structured systems. That's kind of why the franchise model exists. They want you to do it their way. If they've got a game plan, they expect you to execute it. Um, you know, is there leeway in there? Sure. And it depends on the company too. Some are more strict than others. Uh, more established franchisors are probably going to be more strict because they've been doing it longer. Whereas some of the newer ones, you may be there to help them um, you know, craft that. Um, there are territory restrictions. Again, that can be good or bad. Uh, it protects you in a certain location or area. If it's a bricks and mortar, it could be miles around your location. And if it's more of a service company, it could be you know zip codes that you own. So you are protected, but it also restricts you to only operating in that area uh, unless you were to buy more. So that's you know a pro or a con, depending on how you look at it. But some view it as restrictive. You can only sell their products, and there's a cost to all this. Um, you know, they're going to take they the franchisor in exchange for all this on the on the left hand side here. They're going to take uh, part of your sales. There's going to be a what's called a royalty payment that you will have to pay ongoing over the course of your uh, of your agreement. Your ten typically a ten year agreement. You'll be paying them royalties. So again, a trade off. I'm going to check the chat real quick. Absolutely. So there are franchise attorneys that, um, so two things on that. The question was, do you have legal resources that I can reach out to get help with franchise or legal disputes? Yes. So, so there are franchise attorneys that will assist with that. Hopefully it doesn't get to litigation. But we always advise clients in this due diligence process at some point towards the end, if you're really getting serious about a particular franchisor, we always highly recommend, and I, I have I have peer I have um, referral partners where I would say, hey, speak, engage this franchise attorney, have them review the franchise disclosure document, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and the franchise agreement, and make sure you know exactly what you're getting into, what your obligations are. Um, and, and exactly the language. And, and so you know what it is you're getting into. Uh, and so there's no surprises. Here we go. So yes, we went back to, you know, we can have a business that's, that's your own that you create from scratch or franchise business. And I, you know, I do get this question why not I just do it myself? And again, that's this country was built on that. The, th the thing to remember is it's not always as easy as, hey, I've got this great cafe I want to open. Um, you know, I know what products I want to sell and I, I just think it would be great. But day one, there's all these things you got to think about uh, to truly be successful. And this is just, I won't read these, you can read. Um, but, and this is just scratching the surface. There's just so many decisions and things to think about um, and, and to do and execute. And, you you know, you may have a partner and obviously you can have employees, but as, as the person that's responsible of franchise E or 
in this case, the individual business owner. These are all things that are important and things you need to think about. Uh, and this is, this is the advantage of a good franchise system as much of this is mapped out for you. Some of it directly provided to you, you know, other parts of this, at least really strong guidance. So we talked about franchise, Fran, what, what is it? So pretty simply, a franchise is a license, legal uh, uh, license to use a, a series of names and trademarks, products, business systems, the, the, the blueprint, right? The, the process, the business, um, in exchange for, there'll be an initial franchise fee uh, that varies widely depending on the, the company and how much territory you buy or locations you commit to, uh, and an ongoing royalty. So, so again, off the, typically as a percentage of your gross sales off the top for the for the life of the of the agreement. So from a legal standpoint, this is what a franchise is. You know, it's not. A franchise, oh, you know, a, if you hear professional sports franchise or, you know, in the movie industry, you know, if there's a series of, of movies, oh, it's a, you know, the, the Star Wars franchise. You know, those are different connotations, different, different um, definitions. This is what a franchise in the small business world truly is. And so with that, what, what is one of those advantages I talked about earlier, disclosure? So a number of years ago, back in probably the 60s, I think in 1972 was the actual year that the federal government, you know, passed um, <clears throat> passed legislation to help protect people that are considering a franchise business. Before that, there were a lot of companies out there selling concepts, you know, and and there wasn't a whole lot to it. Um, and so there was it got to the point where some of the states tried to step in. Federal government finally said, "Let's let's bring some uniformity to this." So they passed legislation, and legislation, and within that, uh, this franchise disclosure document became a very big part of being a franchise. So you have to file that every year with the Federal Trade Commission, update it, uh, make sure it's accurate and current, and there's a whole lot of disclosure in there. Think of this much like. If you were buying a mutual fund or some sort of financial security, you 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 have to be disclosed and given a prospectus, right? A prospectus tells you, okay, this this con this financial instrument invests in this. These are the fees. Everything you should know about making that investment. That's what a franchise disclosure document does. So within that, there are several chapters or items they call them with a whole bunch of different information. The initial you know, three or four are time and business, who runs this company, who are the executives, what's their experience? Um, have they ever filed for bankruptcy? Have they ever been sued? So it gives you a sense of the, the background uh, and if there are any red flags there. Then it's gonna explain to you in pretty, uh, pretty specific detail, what does it cost to start this franchise? that obviously varies widely. I mean, truly, <laughs> I mean, we have incredibly uh, great franchise companies in our inventory that are reputable, have a long track record. Uh, just by the nature of what they do, they're, they're not super expensive, 60, 80, $90,000 all in. That can go right up into the millions, right? If you're owning multiple locations of, of a restaurant. So there's a, there's a wide range in this, uh, series of items is going to explain to you, hey, what is the franchise fee? What are the other costs to get in it? Equipment, startup, even working capital. You know, you should have X number of months of working capital because no business is profitable day one. Um, so it's very, very detailed and it's critical to know whether you can afford it or not, whether it fits into your goals. It's going to talk about the royalties, how much they are, how they're calculated, how often they're paid, everything you want to know about what your obligation is with wealth. Franchise contract itself will be in there. They'll explain their, your territory, how that's, um, how that's defined, uh, where you're protected. Real, 
big thing out of all this. It's all good information. You, you need to understand all of it at some point. You wouldn't read this thing all at once, especially if you're only scratching the surface on a bunch of different concepts. But at some point, you'll get more serious or, or not. But in a particular uh, uh, concept, if you do feel it's a good uh, good fit for you, you get to start talking to other franchisees called validation. We'll talk to you know four, five, six, eight other franchisees that are actually in the system and what is their experience? Um, you know, what's their background? Um, how successful are they? How do they feel the support is? What, what is their experience? And it's a powerful thing to be able to talk to people that are actually doing it because uh, it gives you a sense of what it might be like for you. And there's a lot of other, you know, there's a lot of other information here. I won't get into it. A lot of disclosure for you to help make a decision. That's the key takeaway. So, okay. So I'm just look. I'm just reading this. Um, so I don't. I don't personally, and my company doesn't work in that very talk about. That was one of the disadvantages, right? There's not a franchise for everything. Um, so, you know, that particular industry for that question, th there isn't one that I'm aware of. So let's talk myths. There's a series of them. This is not an exhaustive list. But the first one, what most people think is what we see driving around. Franchising is, you know, all fast food and retail. You know, it's, it's, it's McDonald's, it's Subway, it's Jersey Mike's, it's all these Domino's, all these companies. And, you know, that's a big part of it. Probably a third are food and hospitality. Um, but the reality is beyond that, there are 90 different industries, uh, over a million locations, you know, just for reference, McDonald's is one of the bigger, obviously. They have probably 13,000 locations in the U.S., you know, franchising in total has over a million, you know, actual either territories or locations. Uh, and there are over 3,000 individual legally franchised businesses in these different areas. And, you know, look at another way, you know, there are senior care services. You think about um, residential uh, repairs, you know, uh, for, the, for the home. Uh, all manner of cleaning services, both residential and commercial. Um, this goes to the to the retail, but you know the hair and beauty home services is a huge one. You know, roofing companies, siding, you know, flooring in your house, remodeling your bathroom. Um, certainly, automotive, your Meinekes of the world. Um, the companies that do damage restoration. God forbid you have a flood or a tree in the house. Uh, and again, I'm just scratching the surface, but just to give you a sense of that there are uh, the, all these other needs out there in the business world, there's, there's a lot of franchise businesses for that. Even in this business, you know, you hear the term B2B, business to business. So coaching, uh, sign companies, marketing companies, staffing, a lot of different options beyond fast food and retail. So what makes a, a you know a franchise business truly successful? And it's a little counterintuitive, but and I'm picking on McDonald's a little bit, sorry. Um, but you know it's not always the best product. We want to be proud of what we do. We want to you know be able to provide a really good product. However, McDonald's you know doesn't tout itself as you know, Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. They have a functional product that fills a need. Uh, and so it's not the best product, but what makes them so successful over the years is all these other uh, things that they do very well. They know how to market, marketing geniuses. They're really good at site selection. They're extremely consistent. That's ultimately what, and what why a lot of people started copying, you know, McDonald's is one of the first franchise uh, companies 50 years ago, and they were able to take one location and replicate it 13,000 times very successfully. That's not easy to do. You have to be very disciplined. You have to have a system. 
you have to have documentation and you need to execute. This is an execution business every hour of every day. They're great trainers. A number of their senior executives, you know, started out in the restaurant, either a manager or even a line employee and worked their way up. They're great in operations and back office. So, you know, that's sort of the backbone of franchising is the, the, the systems, the processes, and the ability to repeat it is what makes a franchise business successful. You know, some have truly high-end products, um, but the consistency is what's key. It's not a tremendously innovative world. So, so the idea that you have to have this new, you know, the only way to be successful in business is to create the next best mousetrap or something nobody else has. And the reality is, you know, at this stage of our economy and in this country, like most, unless it's technology or healthcare, you know, a new drug or something, you know, there's already a business, you know, fixing pipes or whatever it may be. So how do you be successful on that? Well, you, you have a repeatable system that you can create consolidation, but you're, you're, you have a market, a good market for your product and service, and you go in there and, and you just execute really well. So, you know, the idea that I got to go to maybe a location where nobody else is at, well, if it's in a cornfield, it's, you know, there's nobody else there for a reason because that's not where the people are, it's not where the market is. You know, so when I was with both Wendy's and Canera, we would often look, hey, where, where are the other food companies? That's, the, that's where we want to be. You know, no business gets 100% market share. Um, people have different tastes and different needs and wants. So as long as you're in an area where the market is robust and you execute well, you'll take your percentage of market share and you'll succeed. So franchise companies are typically and, and truly not afraid of competition as long as you execute the model very well. Very common one. Oh, I got to be a, a millionaire. You know, it's super expensive. And it's, that's certainly true if you're, you know, a big building with lots of equipment and, and, and all of that. But as you can see from here, it says 2019 data, but this hasn't really changed all that much, if, if at all. The majority of the companies in our inventory are somewhere between 100 and 400,000 in a total investment. So this, you know, there's not a lot of people that have seven-figure ability to invest, even if you're lending. Um, that's that's a misconception that if, to be a business owner, to own a franchise, I have to already be be wealthy, and that's not true. Um, you know, a lot of a, a lot of companies in the hundred and 100, 125, 200, 250,000 range, uh, legitimate, quality, successful uh, concepts. So you don't have to be always a millionaire at all, for sure. Very much like a home, you know, so, okay, it's $200,000 investment. Do I, do I have to cut a check for that? No, you, you can certainly lend. Uh, there's lending opportunities out there. Uh, scores um, um, basically under the umbrella of the Small Business Administration, um, a government agency, tremendous um, lending capability there. Um, <clears throat> I won't go into that, but there's there's a number of programs. And so ultimately, just like a home, you would have to have a down payment, right? So think of it that way. Um, you know, twenty to thirty percent is going to have to be out of pocket liquid. To invest, uh, but the, the remainder of it can there's other uh, lending opportunities or other ways to to round out that that finance. It doesn't have to be all in a checking account or savings account. So what are those other other areas beyond personal savings? I've had partners, um, so that's a way to go at it. Um, a very uh, popular one in the last two to four years because of the way the real estate market has been. Most everybody's got uh, equity in their home. That can certainly be tapped, even if it's just for the liquid portion, right? The down payment portion. Um, I've had clients use what's called a, a securities back line of credit or portfolio loan. All that means is if you have stocks 
uh, in, in a bond portfolio. You don't want to sell any of that to trigger a tax event. You can lend against it. You can borrow. I'm sorry. You can borrow against it. Um, so it's a loan with the um, with those financial assets being the collateral. Uh, sometimes the seller financing. This last one, most people don't know. I didn't before I started um, in this role. You can you can take a portion of any defined contribution plan, 401k, IRA. My wife's a teacher, so that's a 403b. You can take that tax and penalty free to fund a business. It's been approved by the IRS for 40 years. Um, sounds like it's illegal, but it's not. Uh, and the reason the government allows for that uh, is one, they like to create businesses. So this helps create business and businesses create jobs. So it's one of the few um, exclusions to that. Okay, if I want to take a vacation and I don't have the money, well, I've got a, I've got a lot of money in my 401k. I'll take it from there. Okay, you can, but you're going to get hit with a 10% penalty for taking that money, and then you're going to be taxed at whatever your marginal rate is at that time. So a good third to 40% of that could be gone, uh, whatever you're taking out. But if you fund a business, none of that happens. Tax and penalty free. So it's a really good option. Half my clients utilize it for at least a portion of their investment. And these are just some of the, the long standing relationships we have with companies that help with it. Um, reputable um, and excellent at what they do. So again, there are options. That's the key takeaway. Good options. Another common uh, misconception that there's a correlation. Okay, the more I invest, the more I'm gonna, you know, return. I'm gonna make more. And you know, it would be easy if that was, you know, that was true, because it would be a simple, you know, linear correlation. The reality is, there's so many factors. There really isn't. You know, you you can invest in a very expensive restaurant business with a build out and a beautiful renovation and equipment and, and sadly it can fail. So, you know, that's expensive and didn't return anything. Or you can invest in a service business that, you know, relatively speaking is, 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 is very inexpensive. Um, you know, a residential cleaning business, not super expensive, not a lot of equipment, you know, no inventory. But if you build that customer base and you work hard, you build that over time, and you add houses and houses and houses, that can turn into a very lucrative large business. And again, not a big investment. So just caution on the idea that the more you invest, the more you should expect to make ultimately. Probably my favorite, because I get it all the time. I present, I'm working with a client, I present, you know, a concept that cuts men's hair, great clips. Why are you, why are you presenting that, me that? I, I don't, I'm not a barber, I don't cut hair. Or, you know, Meineke, you know, because it seemed to fit everything else we've talked about. I know nothing about, you know, brakes. I like cars, they're cool, but like, I don't know how to change a muffler. Well, that's perfect because you're not going to be doing the work as the owner. You know, you'll hire experienced technical expertise for that. What a franchise company wants almost all the time in an owner is somebody, one, who understands what franchising is and is willing to use their system. It's not going to come in and say, oh, I got a better way to do everything. If you were to do that, then you should just own your own, you know, barbershop or your own, um, you know, your own auto repair shop. Um, what they want is people that are willing and understand and will use their system and execute it. And they're going to bring all these transferable skills from their prior career or past. So if you have a few great management skills, you know how to manage people, uh, hire, train folks. That's hugely important. If you have uh, financial skills, so you can financially manage your business. Maybe you're a salesperson, so you're not a business development, marketing. You're a great communicator. These are all the things that folks uh, in the franchise or world want in an owner. Those executive level uh, transferable skills, and, you know, the, the, they'll train you on their system. You'll hire 
technicians or barbers or whatever case may be, um, they want owners, um, not not technical expertise or doers on the ground in the business. Area. So should you have an interest in whatever it is? Yeah, but you don't need to be, again, a barber or a mechanic. So I see there's a couple of things in chat. So must be taxable money or pre-tax. So, so in terms of the investment, you know, if you're, if you're using, um, if you were using, I'll have to probably get clarification on this question, but, you know, a, a, again, a 401k, if you're using that money to invest, you won't get taxed on it, nor will you be penalized. So I don't know if that answered, hopefully it did. So what are the two areas uh, in terms of your involvement as an owner. So there's a couple of different ways to actually do it. I mean, the most obvious would be, yeah, you're you're going to be a full-time uh, owner in the business every day. You're not working anywhere else. So that owner-operator model could be a couple of things. You know, it could be you are at a location, uh, being the manager, unlikely because you're probably going to want to own more than one location. But at first, you, you could be at the location or in the territory. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you're looking for, for people that are going to be able to, like I said before, uh, manage whether it's the sales part of it, uh, whether it's the operational part of it, you're, you're in that business every day, maybe not at a debt, maybe not at the, at the counter, uh, but you're, you're actively growing and managing and developing the business. Uh, and this is your full-time gig. There are other models that allow for somebody to have a job, and it's more of you have a manager at a location or a series of locations, and you're managing them. And in that case, there, you know, as long as you've got good people in place, you could have a job or another business or other interest, or maybe you're just at the point where you want more of your own free time. So it's not 40, 50, 60 hour uh, commitment of your time, you're managing a manager, making sure that they've got what they need, uh, they're doing the day to day. And this tends to be for people that, you know, maybe want a side gig, supplemental income, maybe it's something they're gonna, you know, hand down to a, to a sibling or a child, um, or they just have another job uh, and they want to diversify. You know, some people trade stocks on the side. Some people own rental property. You know, this could be another option. Um, again, 15, 20, maybe 25 hours a week depends on the, you know, the, the company, the model and how much experience you have. But there is a, a, a whole world out there in franchising of semi-absentee ownership. It's not passive. It's not like you don't have it. You just, you know, you invest and you're going to get checks every month. There's still, um, <laughs> there's still effort there. It's just not your total effort. So just to, just to give people a sense of, well, you know, is it really are people like me doing this? I mean, this is just real quick. Some of the clients in the last couple of years I've had, and you can see it's from sort of all walks of life single mom, uh, husband and wife, um, different levels, different kinds of businesses. So, you know, the, the idea of this, you know, this one makeup of a person or one background of a person, people come from, from you know, all walks, um, all, you know, all levels of business in their prior life. You know, I think the couple of things that are really key is people that understand the amount of work it'll take, <clears throat> It's going to need to be some grit uh, and that they're willing to work it. You know, you can always find a place where your skill set is going to be the primary skill set required for the business and the rest of it, you know, either the franchisor is helping with or you're hiring. The key to, you know, all of it, no matter who you are, what your background is, or what business you would ultimately own is to know that in franchising, why you why your own business owner? This is your business. 
uh, but you're not in it by yourself. You have franchisor support and you have other franchisees that are your peers. Okay, so the last section of this, you know, for those that may, you know, have just a little bit of interest and say, okay, well, where would I start? And I and I go at this in three three buckets. The, the first is truly to step back and say, okay, what does the business do? And what am I going to do in that business? This is so key. This is why it's the first one. So I mentioned earlier that I worked for for Panera Bread for a number of years. I was, in, I was a, a corporate employee. Bakers, I met a ton of bakers in the restaurants and they just love to bake, right? They love the process, the creativity, the, the product and, you know, baking something that somebody else is going to consume. They're just, they're so passionate about it. Getting their hands in the dough, the whole thing. And, and I always wondered, you know, when people would say, you know, as a baker, I have a dream one day to own my own bakery. That's great. That's an awesome dream. But I always would hope that they knew that if they own the bakery, that a bakery is like any other business. It has employees. It has inventory. It has landlords. It has insurance people. It, I could go on and on, right? And these, the, the operations and the function of a bakery is more than just the baking. So if you're a baker and you love to bake and you want to own a bakery, make sure that if the baking is what you want to do as an owner, that there's something else, somebody, there's other people that can do all these other things. Hire people, train them, manage them, check in the order, make sure it's financially um, um, operating correctly, that you're marketing it correctly. So people are coming in the door, all those things, because you can't do it all. There's not enough hours in the day and, and time in the week and sanity in, in your head. So know what the business does and what your role will be in that business. Critical. The second thing is get out a legal pad and a pencil and say, you know, why am I doing this? What, what are the things that I want this to replace for, from your past or, or solve for, whatever the case may be? What is important to you? What what will this business help me achieve? Is it more time or at least more flexible time for family? Is it the independence and control com component? Is it, uh, you know, more personal impact? Hey, this is, this is mine. And I worked in a company, I, it happened to me where I got kind of lost. Uh, I've had a number of people that say, you know, I just, I've lived in this town forever and I, I want to feel more connected and be involved. And, you know, it could be a number of these things, you know, some combination, and this is just a small list, but, you know, jot down those things that are really important that th this business would need to, you know, have or solve for. Because the last thing you want to do is, is, is to get into it and, and realize it's not fulfilling. So that's the second thing. And then the third real key thing is, okay, what, how, what am I going to bring to it? And this is part of matching someone to an appropriate business too. What am I good at? What do I like to do? What's that skill set that I'm going to bring to this? Am I, do I have a past in business development, sales, relationship building? Do I love to do that? Am I good at it? That, that should be like a primary focus of a business. So in that case, you know, something like a restaurant, yeah, it's helpful, but a restaurant thrives because you can execute at the location every day. So it's more management, it's more logistics, it's more details. It's, you know, people are gonna come in your door because you're marketing. That's not really a business development, sales, relationship building. Yeah, you wanna know your customers, but that's not the primary function of that business. Operations would be the primary requirement for that kind of business. As your background in customer service, um, um, helping solve problems for existing clients uh, and making sure that they're happy and they've got what they need and they're satisfied. More on the, you know, the human resource financial management. You've got a, you know, corporate finance background like I did, so you can financially manage a business or manage people. What are your transferable skills? Find a business that's going to, uh, you know, requires those skills and that's a better match. 
want to make sure you're not doing this. And then with that, that part of it is, you know, what is the day to day? So yeah, now I got, now I'm applying my best skills that I'm good at and that I like, but what's my environment like? That's key too. So do I want business with a lot of employees? I like building big teams. Do I want only a few key employees? What is my budget? What's the business environment? Am I in a suit or, you know, is it blue collar? Do I want to do this full time or, you know, part time? Is this a multi-unit location play or do I just want, you know, one location, a, you know, a sign company where, you know, you don't have five locations, you have one and you operate your business out of that. Do I want to work with clients in their homes or do I want to work with other business owners? So who is your customer? Do I prefer a service or, you know, a tangible product? Am I comfortable doing something that's new? It's sort of, um, you know, cutting edge or whatever, or, you know, you like the tried and true. Early adopter, I guess, would be the new, right? Um, does it have to grow tremendously, or are you happy just sort of steady eddy and operating the business and, you know, you're not looking to build a non -part? So these are just a few examples, you know, what does that day-to-day -day look like? Do you like to work out of your house or do you want to go to a location? And you put all these factors together and it starts to narrow down what's going to be, what's going to be appropriate. For you. So kind of an abrupt end, but, um, you know, those are things to consider. Uh, it's just scrap, you know, this is 50,000 foot kind of thing, just trying to give people a little backdrop, uh, a little information on franchising. Um, happy to answer questions. I think a couple of those, I, I Probably didn't answer perfectly, um, but happy to try to clarify anything. This is my contact information. Um, you can always contact me directly. It's my phone number, my email. Um, the QR code would give you a, um, a quick questionnaire if you wanted to, you know, have a chat. No obligation. Um, happy to do that. We have an assessment we provide to people that talks about their motives and values and communication styles. And it's, it's a tool we use to help start the conversation around what kind of businesses people uh, might be good at and might be a fit for. Um, so you can feel free to snap that. I mean, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm here to help in any way without pressure, or obligation, any sales pitch. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dana. Uh, lots of really great information. Um, and I also encourage you to uh, also reach out to a SCORE mentor. We do have SCORE mentors with experience with franchises as well. Um, but FranNet is a partner for with SCORE. And, um, you know, Dana has always been really great at uh, getting back to people when they have questions about different things. Um, I don't see any additional posted questions. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. And thank you all for joining us. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Teresa. Bye. Bye-bye.